Others? Any others? Lord in prayer dear Lord we just pray Lord you be with the many prayer requests that's listed on our list Lord Lord we pray that you be with this family Lord that's dealing with the loss of a grand, grandma and grandmother and mother and daughter and, or mother and father at the same time Lord Lord we just pray that you touch that family in a very special way Lord Lord, even when they're ready to go, Lord, it's, it's still hard to the family, Lord, and, and to lose both at once. That's, that's couldn't even imagine, Lord. Just pray that you be with them, Lord. Lord, we just pray that you be with the many others on their prayer request and just lift their needs up, Lord. Lord, we pr know that there's many here, Lord, that's got unspoken requests, Lord, but we know you know each and every one of them, Lord. Lord, also ones at home, Lord, that's got requests, Lord, we know that you know each and every one of them as well, Lord. Lord, we just pray that you be with Gary and Joyce and Rodney and Sandy as they're traveling. Lord, we just pray for safe travels for them, Lord. And Lord, we pray for Brother Tim as he stands before us now. Lord, we just pray that you'll give him the words that we need to hear, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you for everything you do for us. All right, now if y'all was in Sunday school this morning, some of you might be disappointed because it ain't Tim Allen, as Larry said earlier, so... <laughs> Tim Martin's going to come up here and have our message this morning. Thank you, Tim. Well, I reckon I should be introduced as a disappointment more often than what I am, but it just feels weird when it happens. I appreciate that, brother. No, I'm not Tim, Tim Allen. I told them I'd be happy to do a 30-minute political monologue, Johnny Carson style, if they wanted me to. I can, I can keep up. It was a drying set, not a set up. There's a difference. Anyway, 1 Kings chapter 17. will be in verses 1 through 9 this morning. In light of this whole COVID foolishness, humorous t-shirts have been printed up. A lot of different logos out there. But one of the ones that got me chuckling the hardest right at the beginning was these t-shirts that said had a uh, silhouette of that Bigfoot on it, and it said social distancing champion across the front. Y'all seen those? Yeah, I like those. But if ever there was a man, critter, whatever he's supposed to be, that could live cut off from the rest of us, I guess Sasquatch would, would fit the bill. Social distancing has cut us off from a lot of things, though, hasn't it? Are y'all tired of the crazy mask yet? Really, you go back to having a regular conversation where we can understand one another. COVID restrictions have cut us off from 
having just a decent conversation with somebody. It's cut us off from hugs and handshakes. Well, when this stuff is over, please don't hug me. I'm strictly old-fashioned Baptist. Shake my hand. I'm good with that. But then it's also cut us off from, uh, in some uh, states, cut us off from meeting together for worship. California's g- giving the churches out there a fit, trying to shut them down. It's cut us off from seeing one another's facial expressions. It's cut many small business owners off from financial stability. First Kings chapter seven or chapter seventeen, verses one through nine tells the story of a prophet who knew what it was like to be cut off. Elijah was God's social distancing champion let's begin reading with verse 1 chapter 17 of first kings and elijah the tishbite who was in the inhabitants of gilead said unto ahab as the lord god of israel liveth before whom i stand there shall not be dew nor rain those years but according to my word and the word of the lord came unto him saying Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. And it came to pass... After a while that the brook dried up, because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. And may God add blessing to the reading of his word this morning. Elijah successfully endured being cut off from normal life for a season. After prophesying a famine, God sustained Elijah by the brook Cherith and then at Zarephath. And so let's talk first of all about the backdrop before we get to uh, the second part, the brook. We're going to talk about the backdrop of 1 Kings 17 first of all. If you look in verse 1, we have basically three uh, Ingredients in the recipe of this backdrop. You've got an idolatrous king. Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab. Ahab's the king of uh, Israel at this time. He is uh, fixing to hear the, the first words of Elijah that we have of him saying here in the whole of the Bible. This is the first time he breaks on the scene. And Ahab was an idolatrous king himself, him and his wife. Anybody remember his wife's name? He was married to Queen Jezebel. And both of those together set up pagan worship throughout the land. Her main god was the god Baal. And due to her influence, he became influenced as well. So Ahab made sure that There were olive groves planted all over the hillsides because it's in these uh, olive groves that they would set up an altar to Baal. And Baal was basically the weather god, the god of rain and thunder and storms. And so he made uh, Israel more idolatrous than it had ever been. And we see the whole sad story to Ahab. If you go back up into chapter 16 just a little bit and read verses 32 and 33 it sums up Ahab's life there it says in verse 32 of chapter 16 and he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal which he had built in Samaria and Ahab made a grove and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him it's a pretty sad tale there that uh, it paints of King Ahab. And so you've got an idolatrous king, more idolatrous than they have ever seen in their history. 
But then secondly, you've got an insistent prophet already said he shows up for the first time in scripture here in chapter 17 and verse 1 elijah says he was uh, from gilead now gilead was not under king ahab's jurisdiction it laid outside the territory and later on king ahab dies as a result of trying to overtake that territory uh, and that's later on in the history of israel but it he, he wishes he had jurisdiction over there even at this time in history. He just hasn't got it yet. And so Elijah comes on the stage from out of nowhere. It's not really on Elijah's, on Ahab's radar. And he's able, I think, to get my with saying a whole lot to the king because of that. Elijah was a prophet with a particular message of impending drought, which he had prayed for. Look over at James chapter 5 very quickly, just as a, a reference check. James chapter 5, flip over the New Testament. James chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Because you need to understand this as we go forward. He actually prayed for this drought. And this is a drought that would affect his immediate situation. He's praying for a drought on the land. Well, you know, that, that takes some courage because he's living in the land. Verse 15, James tells us about this man of prayer, Elijah. It says, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he, have, if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And so, talking about the theme of prayer here in James... And James reaches all the way back to the Old Testament to Elijah to bring up a prime example of what that looks like. And Elias, which is Elijah, the way you spell Elijah in the New Testament Greek, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. And so James reaches way back for this fine example of prayer as he's closing out his epistle. But we don't, we don't really learn that Elijah uh, prayed for this drought right here in our immediate text over in 1 Kings 17. But it does add some weight to our understanding when we come to grips with that. He was praying for drought. And there's a reason he was praying for drought on the land he did so to make one truth heard. And that truth is this. There is only one God. Only one true God. And so here's this prophet. He comes from out of Ahab's jurisdiction to big King Ahab, who's erected all these uh, idols to the god Baal. He says, there's only one true God, which has the chaff to hide of, of Baal, because that's just a blasphemous state. Anytime you come and say, Baal's not God, that's blasphemy. But then as we see he's an insistent prophet, we've got an idolatrous king, an insistent prophet, but there's also an inflexible message that that insistent prophet preaches. First of all, the message was inflexibly judgmental. It wasn't a message that was warning people that it was time to worship God alone. Those messages had already been preached. God had already sent those prophets onto the stage before now. Sometimes God says, all right, season of mercy is over. It's time for judgment. And we're at that stage at this point. Elijah doesn't say there's going to be a drought unless you confess your sins. He said there's going to be a drought now. Time for, for begging for forgiveness is over. Your hearts are too hardened. It's time for judgment. It's an inflexibly judgmental message. There's not going to be any rain for three years. The message was also inflexibly anti-Baal. Baal was, as I said before, the God of rain. And in an agricultural economy, when you're raising crops and raising sheep and raising cattle and oxen, what do you have to have in order to make money? Rain. Got to have rain. Got to have pasture lands. Got to have lands for crops, for feed, to feed the, 
the oxen and the stuff you make your living with. You, you're de- it, just overwhelmingly dependent upon weather, and so your God is tied to your economy if you're a bell worshiper. And so out steps Elijah and says, your God's not even a real God. I'm telling you, your God, your God of rain, yeah, it ain't going to rain. Ain't going to rain until I say it's going to rain. And so in a lot of who their God was, that's an incredibly blasphemous statement to make. And it's incredibly judgmental, incredibly anti-Baal. One true God. Now, we've got the same message still today. How many ways are there to get to God? One. One. And who's that through? Jesus Christ. And we're living in a day and age where we want many ways to get there. And we want to justify our own works. And we want to justify our own way to get to God. But there's only one. In John chapter 14, verse 6 Jesus says, I am the truth, the life, and the way. No man comes unto the Father but by me. It's an incredibly inflexible message. It's an incredibly anti-false God kind of message that we still preach today. A message that we preach today as Christians is very similar to the one Elijah was preaching in his day. One true God and ain't but one way to get to him, and that's through Jesus Christ. So not only do we have an idolatrous king and insistent prophet, we have an inflexible message. And those three things form the backdrop of this whole passage. Now as we move forward, we're going to look at the brook of 1 Kings 17. Time spent beside the brook Cherith shaped Elijah for future events. And let's examine those future events. Uh, events and characteristics of that time spent uh, this morning. And this is where I'm going to spend the bulk of, of the message. We notice, first of all, it was a sheltered time. Look at verse 2. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. Hide. God tells him to go hide. I like that term, but I kind of don't like that term. I I don't like to hide. God tells him to go and hide. Go and run. Now, why on earth would God need to hide his prophet off out in the middle of nowhere? Why do you think? Huh? So who wouldn't kill him? Ahab, that's part of it. See, Ahab also had a lot of power over what we call the narrative today. You know what the narrative is? The narrative is our word that we use in the media today. Uh, It has nothing to do with truth. You can deviate from the truth as long as you're consistent with the narrative. How many of you have seen that play out on the political page? It doesn't matter what the truth is. They've got a story they're going to put forth, and you better agree with it and hold with the storyline, or you're not in the in crowd anymore, right? All right? So you have the truth over here. It doesn't matter anymore in our day and age. And then you have the narrative. They've got the story they want to put forth. And so as long as you have the narrative and are consistent with the narrative, that's fine. The minute you start telling the truth, not so good. Well, Elijah told the truth, and the king decided to develop the narrative. And the narrative that the folks believed at the time was, this is Elijah's fault. And so, droughts don't happen all at once. It takes time for things to dry out, turn brown, die and wither, and blow away. So, this gave Elijah enough time to get across the country and down to the brook Cherith. By the time the people figured out their crops are drying up and their oxen are are dying and their livestock are dying and that they have to walk further to find water, there was still water in the land. We'll find that out later. The book Kidron is still flowing, but it's a lot harder to find water in a drought. It's often not impossible, but 
if so much of your economy is dependent upon it, it's going to affect the pocketbook. And so when you have a prophet who was known to pray for a drought, then the drought happens, it's easy to blame it on the prophet, right? Rather than their own sin of Baal worship. If you flip over to chapter 18, verse 17 tells the tale. After being in hiding for about three and a half years, Elijah comes out of hiding and and orchestrates a meeting with King Ahab. And when Ahab comes out to meet Elijah, the first words out of King Ahab's mouth are these. Verse 17, 1 Kings 18, And it came to pass, when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? So we know that King Ahab and the people of the land, because people are going to buy what the king says. They're going to believe the king. Hey, this is Elijah's fault. And so I figure Elijah didn't have a whole lot of friends left in the land. As a matter of fact, later on, he finds out he's not the only prophet, but left that has been true to the Lord, but he certainly has felt like it for a long time. Elijah, in his mind, and it was so, such a, a, an emphatic thing, he was just overwhelmed by the, with loneliness. So I know he had to feel like everybody was out to get him. So God told him to go down and hide by the brook Cherith. The narrative was he was the one that was troubling Israel. Of course, in chapter 18, verse 18, Elijah says, No, I'm not the one troubling Israel, my paraphrase. And he looks at the king and says, You're the one that has led them into idolatry. So you have a sheltered time there by the brook Cherith. You also have a severed time. It's also a severed time for Elijah. The brook Cherith in Elijah's town was located in an isolated, undeveloped, and unpopulated part of the country. Interestingly, Cherith means cut off in Hebrew. The actual name literally means cut off. So when God said to Elijah, I want you to get me down by the brook Cherith, he says, I want you to get me down by the brook that is cut off from the rest of society, cut off from people. It's isolated. It's lonely. I want you to go there, and I want you to hide, and I want you to dwell there. Have you ever lived through a severed time in your own life when it's lonely and it's dry and it's away from folks and it's isolated, a time when you were cut off from others, walking through a season that was lonesome, but necessary, cut off from friends and cut off from resources. You see, Elijah was cut off from his normal routine. Whatever job he had been doing in day-to-day life, he couldn't do that anymore. He couldn't get back to his hometown. He had to go live by the brook Cherith. He couldn't go be with the friends that he may have cultivated. He had to go live isolated. He couldn't go make a living. He couldn't have the relationships He had to live cut off from society. Not only was it a shelter time and a severed time, it was a sustained time. Look at verse 9. After the brook dries up, God tells him to go to the brook, go to Zarephath. It says in verse 8, I'll back up. Verse 8 says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to what? Nice word, sustain. Now, if you look back up in verse 4, And it shall be when thou shalt drink of the brook, I have commanded the ravens to do what? Feed thee there. The same Hebrew word for sustain in verse 9 is translated as feed in verse 4. In verse 9, the widow woman's going to feed him or sustain him. In verse 4, the ravens are going to sustain him. How many of you have ever lived through a season in your life when you were sustained? 
just sustained. Oh, some of y'all Kenneth Copeland fans who want to, you know, the voice of victory and walking in abundance and, and, and Joel Olstein's uh, your best life now and your cup's running over. Oh, man, we all like times of abundance, but how many of you know sometimes we don't walk in abundance? Some seasons we are sustained, and that's it. A lot of people think if you ain't walking in abundance, you're out of the will of God. Is that biblical? Do you remember the story of the widow's mite? She only put in one mite. Everybody else dropped in huge chunks of money into the coffers at the temple. But she only put in a penny's worth. And yet Christ said what about her? Did he... Did he uh, preach about her with disdain? Did he teach his disciples he wished he would have went out and worked harder gained more money before coming and dropping it off in the coffers? What did he say? She put in more than anybody else. She was living on faith and she was trusting in a God to sustain her. And so here Elijah is. He's living by a brook that's drying up. His resources are drying up. And it says he was sustained. Sometimes that's all we get. Oh, we love times of abundance, but sometimes sustain is all we get. Let's look at chapter 3 of Psalm. Go to Psalm 3. This psalm is about David, David running from his own son, Absalom. Absalom, at, at this particular point, has called off many of the mighty men that used to follow David. Absalom has gotten mad at his father for uh, a number of things that he built up over the years. And so Absalom feels like it's his turn for the throne. And he staged a coup and he's run his daddy out, King David, out of his own palace, has taken over David's property, and now is hunting David across uh, the fields and the, and the hillsides and uh, running from cave to cave chasing his dad and trying to track him down and kill him. And it's in the middle of this running from his own son that, that David writes this psalm. He says, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me my glory, and the lifter of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I said, I, I laid me down and I slept. I'll wait for the Lord what? Sustained me. You know, David was used to living in the luxuries of the palace, but he can't lay down in the comforts of his palace now, can he? His son will come in and kill him. He's off out on the hillsides living like a pauper now. He's not got all the luxuries of his palace. He's living in a time where instead of walking in abundance, he's just being sustained. And he says, even though they're trying to kill me, God's allowed me enough peace to finally get some rest, some sleep. I've laid me down. I'm awake now. God sustained me. I've lived through another night. So a man who had enough wealth back at the palace to buy all the luxuries and to snap his fingers and get whatever he wanted, now is just thanking God for the simple pleasure of sleep, a night's rest, just barely being sustained. Can we thank God when we're just being sustained? Or does it take the abundance and the wealth for us to be grateful? It's a sustained time. It's also a stretched out time. Back to chapter 17. Look at verse 5. Elijah's down here by the brook. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went. And what's that word there? Dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. You know, as a small child, you hear this story. And if you ever went on camping trips with Dad, 
man, that's what you got in mind. You got, you got a camping trip in mind. It goes by, you, you romanticize it in your head. It's a cute little romantic brook. Got some fish in it, maybe. You go take a camping trip by the brook, Cherith, and do a little fishing, and the raven's going to feed you there. They, they're dropping off food. Man, it sounds like a good time. It sounds like a great getaway. But then we run up against that word dwelt. If you dwell somewhere, what are you doing? You're living there. It's a lot longer than any camping trip. You're being sustained for a very long time. Those ravens are not dropping off, you know, cargo trailers filled with Milky Way bars and hamburgers. You're being sustained, only eating what the ravens can carry in. And you're being sustained for a very long time. You're living there. This ain't a camping trip. You got to go with the mindset sometimes when you're in, when you're by having a, a by the brook cherith kind of experience, get used to it for a season, settle down. Because it may take a while for you to come out of that. Some valleys are longer than others, amen. Some valleys are deeper, darker, and wider than others. We all want them to hurry up and be over with pretty quick, but this ain't no camping trip. Well, I just got to hang out there for a while. That's a hard principle to learn, to be patient even by the brook Cherith. It was a strain time. It was a sheltered time, a severed time, a sustained time, a stretched out time, and a strain time. Imagine already being in an uncomfortable circumstance, cut off from friends, family, resources, creature comforts, and what little bit of encouragement you do have happens to be drying up. He had to sit there and watch, watch the brook Cherith dry up in a drought that he had prayed for. Watching resources evaporate is discouraging, is it not? How many of you ever watched your bank account slowly dry up? It ain't fun! Have you ever gone through a season where month after month the bank account dwindles and dwindles and dwindles? And then beyond a shadow of a doubt, you realize this is a scorched time. The heat had to be almost unbearable. No rain and the lamb before him was turning brown day after day after day. What little bit, bit of green vegetation would have naturally been around the brook would have dried up and blown away by now. Any pleasant comfort the brook had brought all of a sudden was gone because the brook dried up. So it was a scorched time. Brooks dry up. It dried up in verse 7. But then it was a shared time. The heat had to be unbearable. Brooks dry up, but God doesn't. Look at verse 8 and 9. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Oh, you ain't going to be walking in abundance there either, Elijah, but guess what? You're still going to at least be sustained Communion with God takes place even beside of dried up brooks. Communion with God took place there at Cherith. The ravens kept coming until that brook dried up. He continually was fed day by day in a very miraculous way. Brooks dry up, but God doesn't. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 is still true. It says there, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And just because the brook dries up doesn't mean God walks out. He's still there. And so he appoints him to go to Zarephath in order to continue to sustain him through this time. 
It's also a strengthening time. It's a strengthening time. Chapter 18, verse 1 says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. So it's been three and a half years now that Elijah has been sustained. Sometimes those seasons of just being sustained last longer than we want them to. Three and a half years feels kind of long when you're just being sustained. But he's made it through it. He's come out of hiding now. He goes, presents himself before Elijah. I mean, Elijah goes, presents himself before Ahab. And then in the verses following, uh, picking up with 17 and following, it tells the story of how Elijah told Ahab, go get the prophets of Baal. Go get the 450 prophets of Baal and all the prophets that sit down and eat with your wife and bring them to you. And so that was close to... 900 prophets that Elijah was trying to meet with there uh, up the hillside from the brook Kindred. Only f the 450 prophets of Baal that, he, that was originally mentioned actually show up. The other 500 or so do not come. And Elijah challenged those prophets of Baal. He said, I'll tell you what. Now this is uh, Preacher Tim's uh, paraphrase and not King James Version. You, you follow me? Elijah said, told the prophets of Baal, y'all set up an altar and put your sacrifice on it and y'all can pray. And then I'm going to set up my altar and I'm going to put a sacrifice on it and I'm going to pray to my God. I'll pray to your God, I'll pray to my God. Whichever God consumes the sacrifice, that's the true God. The prophets of Baal said, okay, we're game. They built their altar, they threw their sacrifice on it, and prayed from early that morning all the way through lunchtime, long about supper time, the evening hours. They're still praying and nothing's happened yet. Elijah says, I want you to bring me up three barrels of water from down, down the hill there at the brook Kidron. Drag them up here. So they dry, drug up three barrels of water, dumped it on his sacrifice on the altar that he had built. He not only built that altar, but he dug a trench around it. So they hauled up those three barrels of water. He says, okay, let's, or four barrels of water, excuse me barrels of water. They go back down the hill and bring back up four more barrels of water. When they get those dumped on the sacrifice, the water starts to stand up in the trench he dug around his, his altar. He says, all right, I want you to go bring me back four more barrels of water one more time. So three times, four barrels of water were brought up that hill and dumped on that sacrifice. So now his sacrifice is sopping wet. He prays to his God fire falls from heaven, consumes the sacrifice, and licks up all the water. He then, he then commands all of the prophets of Baal to be taken down by the brook Kidron and to be killed there. Now the irony is not lost on me here. I see what just happened. The ones who serve the rain god were killed by a brook that their God could not fill up. <clears throat> and once again, Elijah has been true to his message. There is only one God. Such a mighty victory for Elijah over the prophets of Baal. There on Mount Carmel, where he built his altar. I mean, it was a huge victory for him. One prophet standing up to 450. And I tell you that story to say this. 
in order to have a Mount Carmel experience, he had to have a Brook Cherith experience. He had to have that time with God, that severed time, that sheltered time, that sustained time, cut off from the rest of everyone. He had to have that time there at the widow's house eating from a meal barrel that did not run dry. He had to have that kind of faith building time in order to have that kind of faith victory on Mount Carmel. And sometimes we get tired of just being sustained. But don't worry, there's a Mount Carmel in our future if we'll be patient. Some of us try to lead the Brook Cherith or the Widow's house a little too soon. But we need to have those kinds of times in order to strengthen our faith. Living on COVID time has similarities to the Brook Cherith. How many of you know in this room, everybody's been living on COVID time now for what, good six months? Like Elijah, we've lived through a season of our own shelter in place orders, hiding out at the house more than we like to, to do, more than we used to. It's been a severed time. We're cut off from normal routines. Others are cut off from family members in nursing homes. Uh, Don't get to see mom. She's in an assisted living facility. Has been since way before COVID started. With employment being affected, many have been cut off from financial stability during this time. Yet there's been few extras. And even though there's been few extras, God has sustained us. COVID has certainly been a stretched out time with the first restrictions supposedly lasting long enough to flatten the curve. Y'all remember that? Yeah, it keeps dragging on, don't it? That curve flattened months ago and still here we are. The stupid masks grow more and more annoying day by day. Some are cautiously sending their children back to school. Others are trying to figure out how to do virtual classes at the house, and all makes for a strained time. If you're a believer, it's been a shared time with God through the whole ordeal. We know that he's not left us nor forsaken us. With COVID, it seems like the Brook Cherith experience is an experience we're all going through at the national level, are we enduring it like Elijah did? But maybe the Brook Cherith experience is not just something happening at the the national level for you. Maybe it's happening in your life in particular in a much weightier way. No one likes feeling cut off or the feeling of being sustained or just getting by. Living under the strain has lasted longer than maybe you expected or thought you could endure. I know there's a sense in which the Brook Cherith has been my experience for some time. After stepping down from prison chaplaincy at the end of 2019, who knew COVID would hit and influence the fact that eight months later, I'm still not in vocational ministry. I still feel like God has called me into the, into the pastorate, but how many of you understand that COVID restrictions have placed a damper on the way people do church? And it's also placed a damper on the way pulpit committees and pastor search committees work so there's not a lot of those folks actually trying to meet and do a pastor search there's a few that have uh, called me and spoken with me but they're not moving forward yet because they're under they're following too many restrictions and don't feel comfortable at this time proceeding further Um, one church that was pursuing me their pastor search committee chairman come down with COVID. He was the only one in that particular region with COVID. He went on a ventilator and a few weeks later passed away. This shut down the pastor search committee for a while. Well, what did this do 
to a My Brook Cherith experience. <laughs> it elongated it. And so I'm still there. I'm still there. Maybe you're there as well. But it, if you're like me, you've got to believe it can't all be for nothing. I have to believe there's a Mount Carmel experience ahead. You should believe it for yourself as well. Can you endure the Brook Cherith experience the way that Elijah did? The message that Elijah preached is still true today, and it's just as inflexible. There's only one God, and there's only one way to get to God. And if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please do so today. You've been chasing the gods of this world, thou mount to nothing, about like the rain god that, Eli that Elijah's king Ahab served. It's time to place your faith in Jesus Christ. If you would stand, every head bowed, every eye closed. We have some music we can play. Anybody play the piano? Okay, nobody been touching keys. Every, every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody looking around. If you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and I'm not going to call you out, would you just slip your hand up while nobody's looking? If you've never trusted him at all, please slip your hand up. You just want to say, preach, I, I, uh, I've been chasing the gods of this world a little too hard. Time for me to I don't want to trust in the one true God. Would you slip your hand up? Lord, we thank you for today's word. We thank you for the fact that sometimes brooks dry up, but you never do. We thank you for the fact that you never leave us nor forsake us. Help us to endure as Elijah endured. Because after a season, you will bring us out of that kind of experience and march us on to a, a, a victorious one. You will bring us back. The neat thing about seasons, they come to an end. We thank you for that. And we look forward to a time when the Brook Cherith experience will be over at the national level as well. But Lord, for those that are there now, I ask that you give us all a special sense of endurance special sense of trust in you as we move forward. For it's in the name of Christ we ask these many blessings. Amen. Thank you now and God bless.